Hello. How is everyone tonight? So um, I'm going to start by actually telling you guys of a very famous um, ethics dilemma that I'm sure you've been asked about at some point in a meeting or in class. How many of you guys have heard of the trolley dilemma? Oh, not as many as I thought. Okay. So the trolley dilemma, and I'm just going to put it out there because I think sometimes we oversimplify the question of ethics. Um, and this was my first introduction when I first started questioning. I'm just going to put this down. When I first started questioning um, what we mean when we talk about ethics, what does effective leadership mean? What does leadership mean? We talk a lot about these words, and I think we often don't challenge what we're actually saying. So the trolley dilemma, I'm just going to put it in everybody's minds, is there is a trolley going down a track. It's going down quite quickly. And you are standing next to the lever that can stop the trolley. On one track, the one the trolley is going down are five people. They are incapacitated for whatever reason. They cannot move. So if the trolley keeps going down the track it's on, it will kill these five people. You can pull a lever and switch the trolley to the other track where it will only kill one person who is tied to the track. As a leader, what do you do? Right? Now, imagine being 15 years old and this being the question you get asked when you say we should talk about ethics. It's often a difficult conversation to have, particularly in, in fields like medicine, where ethics is actually very much life and death. It's not hypothetical. It's not about budgets. It's about what decisions do you actually make? If you have a colleague who is an anesthesiologist and you know that they are, for whatever reason, incapacitated, do you, do you tell the board? Do you end that person's career because they made a bad decision one day? Or if there's a patient who you know treatment will not help, but they want treatment anyways, and you know it'll actually impact their life in the negative, do you stop them? What decision do you make at that moment? Now, Earlier this year, uh, there was a recent uh, New York Times op-ed by the former High Commissioner on Human Rights. Um, and he said, most of our political leaders are morally weak, short-sighted, and mediocre. He does not mince words. It used to be that abusers were called out and many were stopped. Human rights violations had something to fear. But today, the silence of those public officials is astounding. Their hypocrisy is sickening. And I fear they are no longer willing or able to defend the human rights of all people. And as a result, the worst human rights offenders are able to act with complete impunity. How do I know? Because I was in charge of it. Now, it is difficult, I think, for me to stand here and say, despite the progress that we've made, and we have made progress as a global community, we can all agree on that. Um, polio cases have been decreased by more than 98%. Uh, more than 2.6 billion people have uh, improved drinking water sources. Um, the people without electricity fell below 1 billion. We've, we've lifted more than 600 million people out of poverty. We have done a lot. This is not a speech to undermine what has worked, right? This is a speech to emphasize why it worked and what isn't going well and how we can actually change that. Because the reality is we still have 65 million people who are displaced. We have a global climate crisis that a lot of people still do not believe is a global climate crisis, which I find more concerning than anything else. So I think we have to ask ourselves two questions. Why did certain actions we've taken work? Was it because of, as the vice rector was saying, one individual? What, what is our definition of leadership? and what hasn't gone well. And I'm going to quickly take us back to medicine for a second. And I'm going to ask you guys this question. If you are a doctor or in medical school, you're not allowed to answer. That's cheating. So if you have a patient come in and they have an infection on their arm, what is usually the first thing you should do? Anyone? A patient comes in with a bad infection on their arm. What do we do? You wash your hands, I hope so. I hope you're doing that all the time. Uh, what? You clean the infection. 
So the very first thing we're going to do is we are going to take a history, right? We're going to ask the patient, where did you get this? What happened? We want specifics. We're going to clean it, and not just clean it like superficially and put a Band-Aid on it. We're going to debride it, which usually takes a lot of expertise and knowledge and time. It's an investment, but it really means clean it to the bone. Clean it until it's all out. And we're probably going to want to investigate what kind of infection it is so we can also treat it systemically, right? It's a pretty robust way of doing things. You actually focus on all of those important aspects. You don't just let the patient come in and put a Band-Aid on, because what will end up happening in a week or two? It'll get worse, and you'll have to amputate their arm, right? So it's a temporary solution, but it's ineffective at best. What we see happening today in global politics is the ineffective and temporary at best Band-Aid solutions. That's our biggest challenge when it comes to leadership, is we've built systems that unfortunately prioritize and elevate temporary decision making or quick wins, right? You need a quick win to be able to win your next election cycle. You need to be able to justify why you're putting X amount of dollars into something. And the reality of our, our political systems is that education and healthcare and all of those things that actually build sustainable, successful, prosperous countries, they're not attractive quick wins. You don't see the fruit of investment in education long after you're in office. Same with healthcare. It's a lot easier to focus on sensationalist rhetoric. It's a lot easier to get people riled up about the other or what isn't working. It's a lot easier to tap into fear than it is into potential and to hope. So what gives me hope? Um, lately, it's actually been a cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> and it was for a period Game of Thrones until the, the finale was very bad. Um, but above all, it's my own personal experiences. I've gotten to witness effective leadership on the front lines in conflict, and I've gotten to witness leadership very effective leadership on a global level. Now, Mr. Kapunski has a wonderful quote, when is a crisis reached? When questions arise that cannot be answered. And I think that's probably where we find ourselves today on a lot of global issues. What does human rights mean to us? Who's human rights? That's a question that we cannot substantially answer. We can have like you said, fantastic speeches about it. We can talk, we can give so much lip service. But when it comes to actually putting our values and our morals in action, when it comes to putting money behind them, that's where we lose sight. Now, I can't identify, to be quite frank, with a lot of our definitions of leadership. Um, the best example here I'll give you is when I was 21, 22, I went into my first big UN meeting. And the UN is very fancy when it wants to make sure you know you're important. It etches your name in white into wood. It's not a piece of paper. It's not an electronic thing. No, there is a wood plaque with your name on it. And so I walked into the room and I saw my wood plaque and I got very excited and I had been preparing for this meeting for weeks. And you know, if you are ever 21 or 22 in a, in a room full of 50 and 60 year olds, you know you're preparing extra hard. <laughs> I showed up early, sat down in my spot, pulled out my books, laid everything out, and immediately an intern, maybe a few years older than me, came up to me and said, excuse me, that's Dr. Murabit's seat. And I hear he's very difficult you should go sit in the back with the rest of the support staff. And in a very out-of-body experience for me, I picked up my things, and I went and I sat in the back. And it wasn't until my other colleagues came in saying, what are you doing? Come sit in your seat, that I actually picked my things back up and went and sat in my spot. And for the next two hours of that meeting, the one I had prepared for, the one I had questions and comments on, I instead, and I don't know how many of you do this, where you have it, somebody says something to you, so you spend like your whole shower or your whole ride home thinking of all the things you could have said. I did that. 
And I have 10 brothers and sisters, so I can say some stuff. So, but I sat there and I thought of all of the rebuttals I should have said to her and what I was gonna say to her after the meeting. And immediately after the meeting, she came up to me and apologized and said, I'm sorry, I just, I'm not used to seeing people who look like you or look like me at that table. And so that conversation impacted me, I think, more than I can ever emphasize. I ended up starting a mentorship program later and a program to develop young women leaders after that because I think when we talk about leadership, we often ignore that leadership has historically been limited to a very select group of people. Oftentimes when I walk into a room, people look at my male German executive assistant as the person who's in charge. And when he kind of directs them to me, they always look kind of shocked and then try to cover it up with, oh, of course. <laughs> but I am not a typical leader in today's world. At least I don't look like one. And I would argue most of the people in this room do not see themselves as what we define socially as leaders. We're told that it is the strong voice. We're told that it's the big guy, right? We're told that it's this one person who completely transforms and energizes and, and transcends. And the fundamental reality of everything that's worked, of every social issue we've made progress on, of every economic issue we've made progress on, of every political issue we've made progress on, is that it has never been one person, ever. It hasn't. That might be the voice we hear about, but usually it's completely energized and motivated by a community of people. A community of people who make economic and social and political decisions to get their point across. We define leadership as an individual aspiration because that's easy for us to understand. It translates well. It's great in media stories. It's sensationalized. But the reality of effective leadership is that it is inclusive and that it is local. It is that decisions for Romania are made by Romanians, by people who have experienced the reality of the challenges, not in New York or in Brussels or in London, it is that if you're having a debate about services in your university, the first voices that should be heard are the people who actually attend and pay for that university. Effective leadership is recognizing that if your board has 10% women, you're probably not going to do very well. That's a statistic reality. That's not us trying to be nice because gender equality is cool. We have to start challenging our own definition of leadership. Because as long as we keep looking to one individual to fix or make or break our national or, or global realities, we're going to continue to be disappointed. We're going to continue to look around and wonder why something isn't working. Now, the biggest challenge here is it means we have to invest in a lot more people. We have to stop looking for that one shining light and say everybody is worthy of investment and everybody has the potential to create change. That means we have to start investing realistically in education. Not just education in terms of let's get people in schools, but in quality critical thinking education. We have to start asking people challenging questions, even questions that we don't necessarily want to be asked, about what do our values really mean if we cannot implement them? And what is the value of them if we only ever talk about them? But when it comes to actually putting them in action, we do the exact opposite. We have to start having honest conversations with young children, with our seniors, about our political differences and where they stem from. Because effective leadership is the ability in your own life, in your own space, to actually demand accountability and provide that accountability for your community. My mom had 11 kids and 
She is, to this day, the most effective leader I know. Because each and every single one of her kids went on to do wonderful things. Of course, that's a compliment to myself. And uh, <laughs> no, but genuinely, and at their own, made that decision for themselves. One of my sisters is a plastic surgeon, the other is a stay-at-home mom. And my mom created the environment where both of them felt equally capable of making whatever decision they wanted where my sisters felt as capable as my brothers of making a particular decision or of being leaders. And not once when I was younger was I told that something was out of my reach. And I think oftentimes when we talk about effective leadership, we ignore the fact that it does not start when you're 20 or 21. It starts when you're four and five. That's when effective leadership actually starts. That's when we learn our values and we, we know what morals look like in action. And it's a difficult thing to do, particularly for many of the people in this room, because we're now asking ourselves, OK, what do we do now? That sounds great. I'm not four. I'm not five. What do I do today? And some of you, I hope, will run for office. And some of you, I hope, will become CEOs of great companies. But the vast majority of us will get to exercise effective leadership in our everyday lives. The vast majority of us will have to start demanding accountability in our everyday lives from our political leaders when we vote, from people in our community when we hear statistics like 90% of violence against children and women is perpetrated by people they know. There is not an elected official that is going to step into that. Those are realities of our everyday lives. We're going to need to be the ones to stand up when we see somebody treating somebody else poorly, when we hear a racist or derogatory remark. We can start putting our money into companies that are sustainable. We can start campaigning for people we respect. We can start amplifying media that we trust. And we can start challenging voices and narratives that are sensationalist, that drive negative sentiment. And more than that, each and every single one of us can ask, who is not in the room when decisions are being made? In your workplace or in your school, who are the voices that are missing? Because once we start to actually look at who's not in the room, we can start making a lot better decisions by ensuring that they are there. I'm going to close off with telling you a story about the most effective leader leadership decision I ever saw. I was sitting with a prime minister who is still in office, so I will not name him. Ask me again in a couple of years. And, uh, <laughs> and he was being asked very tough questions on economic trade decisions. Very tough. And this was by his own staff. He was being challenged because he had a press conference the next day. And my job in there was to be able to help prepare him and really ensure that he had the right uh, understanding. And he was getting some of these questions. And then he looked right at us and said, I am not prepared for this. I think I need a couple of experts on this issue and this issue in particular. I need people who really understand and know this so they can teach me, because I do not want to get up there and act like I know. So either we bring them in so they can teach me, or we have them at the press, con press conference itself. But I want my citizens to know that I am somebody who says the truth and that they can trust. And I think why that sticks out to me as such an important moment is because we'll hear a lot about leaders who think they know everything, and definitely talk like they know everything. And I think the rarest quality in leadership today is the ability to know when you do not know. And the ability to say, guys, I need to be taught this. Because humility is lost on a lot of our definition of today's leadership. And the ability to step outside of yourself and say, for the betterment of my community, I need to either learn more of this or bring those experts in is a very unique quality. 
So if I have to say one thing about effective leadership, it is that we are very rarely able, I know I am not, or capable of knowing everything on our agenda. We almost never do. And you are going to have a million mentors in your life. I already, I'm 29, I'm 29, and I already have a minimum of 100 I could name who are going to teach you each a little thing about leadership. They're the single greatest gains we've made in the climate change movement have been women, local women, women who have looked at their own communities in the Marshall Islands or in Ethiopia and said, this is not sustainable. We cannot afford these prices. Our businesses cannot last. Our kids cannot live here. Women who have made local changes. You have 13 and 12 year olds leading marches. You have entire groups, millions of women demanding different. And while it may seem now as though the odds are against them, and it does, I mean, we've all heard a lot of the conversations that are happening about reproductive rights in the US, so it does. The fundamental reality is the more conversations we can have, the more people we can engage, the more voices you have, the more sustainable, the more effective, and the more legitimate that leadership is. One strong man never lasts. We know that. History has taught us that very well. And the single greatest gains we have ever made have been because people like me and like you looked around and said, this is not sustainable. We need to do better. How can we? Now, I have the honor of working with a lot of young leaders in particular. And uh, I'm defining young as under 25, because <laughs> I'm no longer defined as young, which is unfortunate. But, um, but I'm defining young as under 25 here, and, and I've had the pleasure of working with a lot as they've gone through a different series of questioning their own leadership, their own value, and their own roles. And oftentimes, when you're younger, and this happened to me, you are told that you are too young, or that you will learn with experience, um, that it's good to have your voice and your input in the room. Uh, you'll always, you know, people will be like, well, we consulted with young leaders, but I mean, y your actual input really is very rarely what defines the project or, or the decision. And I think my biggest frustra frustration with that is, is our, one of our biggest challenges with the definition of leadership and effective leadership is that we're still letting our grandparents define it, and I mean that with so much respect, but it is a traditional term. It's a traditional definition. When we talk about the strong man, when we talk about uncollaborative and uninclusive leadership, it's a very traditional way of looking at it, and it is a way of ensuring that young people and women and minorities are not part of the conversation. And so if there is one revolutionary act I will propose, to people who are not traditionally defined as leaders, so anyone who's not a white male over the age of 45, it is challenge that genuinely with everything you do. When you are told that you are in the wrong position, when you are told you are too young, when you are told you are too woman, when you are told you are too minority, challenge it. Create a collaborative community that supports you work with people that see eye to eye, work with people who don't, but create an agenda that is inclusive and representative of your community so that nobody can deny your leadership. And ensure that you're in those spaces because the only way we transform this definition, and in my genuine opinion, the only way we transform what is happening in the world today is if new voices have the courage to say, this does not work and I can do better because I fundamentally believe we can do a lot better than what we have. Thank you. What, what can you do when you're in a position of, in, 
of power, not to become short-sighted. And um, I remember that one of my professors in university said something, um, where you sit is where you stand. So when you will be in a certain position, you will, take, you will inherently tend to take those um, attributes of that position and become short-sighted. I think it's just natural. So how do you develop the anti-corps to fight that? Technology has never been my strong suit. Uh, clearly, microphones aren't either. Um, I think that's a fantastic question, and I'd answer it in two ways, at least for me. I think a huge part of it is uh, there's this famous um, study that shows that you are most alike the five people you surround yourself with, and you get, I think it's 80% of your characteristics in daily decision making. Um, really distilled from that. And, and I would say the very first thing is always surround yourself with people who will tell you when you are stepping out of line and when you are being selfish and when you are not being humble in your leadership. Um, and I emphasize that point, to be quite honest, because I do think that I would be in a very different position if I had not had people around me who said, but isn't this what you said last week? Or isn't this what you... And, and, and I also think it takes a little bit of... Um, a humility to be able to surround yourself with those people, right? Because sometimes when people keep saying no to us, we're like, but where are our yes men? And we start looking for those guys. So that would be the first thing. That's more of an internal thing. The second thing is when I learned how to drive, um, I remember my dad taught me how to drive by telling me, look at the car in front of you. That's how you know how to stay in your lane. You look at where the car in front of you is going and you will naturally stay within the lines. And I'm, I would argue I'm the best driver in the world, um, but, but I would also argue that that's actually been one of the best pieces of advice for life in general. Look at someone who is doing work that you admire or look at something that you aspire to. So if you're working on climate change and there is, there's a, a point where you're like, this is where I need to go, it's a lot harder to get distracted from where you're at. And if you're working in global security and you're thinking this is a person who is a, who is a phenomenal leader, it's a lot more difficult to get distracted by the nice shiny things around you in the moment. Those would be my two responses to that. Uh, thanks for the question. This is actually one of my um, personal obsessions uh, because I, I study people in power from the, um, from, from the sidelines and I, I, I see this disease which is that power is a drug and when you start inhaling it, you become less advisable. And the more you are less advisable, the, you know, the, the more stupid mistakes you make. And it's also fascinating to see former prime ministers who after a, a while, like a year or two, they start re-becoming smart persons and they were not at the end of their mandate. And the, the answer is always that they were not advisable. Uh, and this is not only about Eastern Europe. I remember a, a professor I had at Stanford, David Demarest, he used to be the communication advisor of, of President Bush, and he, we were commenting actually the first debate between President Obama and Governor Romney, which you may remember President Obama l was in a very bad shape, and Professor Demarest explained to us that this is usually the case. The president um, um, uh, is usually not very good at the first debate because he's very hard to advise while he's in office. It's not like the candidate, and he told us a story about President Bush who, when there was disagreement in his cabinet, from time to time he would raise his hand and say, who is the leader of the free world in this room, please raise your hand, and that was the end of the debate. <laughs> and, you know, this is in a great system that encourages critical thinking. It's not like, as we very well know, and in Eastern Europe and particularly Romania, which tends to have a very medieval uh, political system, this is a, a, a great problem. My solution, I think, is the same one. You should always have five, six people that you always trust for advice and that you don't only trust for advice, but you encourage to give you advice the more you raise up the... And this is also not only about politics. I've seen this in the NGO sector as well. People who simply become so, um, you know, um, drugged up basically on power that they don't receive advice and they, they, they really become less smart than they used to be. Thank you. There was a question here in the front and if there are others, please let us know.
we're going to, to follow questions also from online. So it's a Slido code, just cap talks. Okay. Um, so I just, uh, well, it's the question comes at the end. It's just a little bit of a comment first. I didn't see the devil's advocate argument at all there. I did not see the devil's ar ar uh, advocate argument. I think that both of you, very, you know, there was a very nice bridge between what you were saying. And I just wanted to say, you know, a couple of things. One, you know, when you say who the first person who speaks up, I think that, you know, from what I understand, the idea is that who feels able to speak up? And we have to make more people feel that they are also going to be able to speak up. And, you know, that will change, of course, you know, structurally with time and all of that. But it's not necessarily something intrinsic in that person. It's what they think about themselves and the fact that they can because of whatever they might have previously experienced. And the other thing I think that, uh, you know, the, uh, Dr. Murabit, your point, I'm an academic, politics and IR, uh, Natasha Kol, uh, University of Westminster. So uh, it made me think of Hannah Arendt's brilliant thing about power and violence. You know, how power is actually not about all of this. Power is about consensus. When you keep calling it power, you keep reinforcing it. And I think what we're seeing globally with leadership, and you know, this is a depressing time for many of us, is this whole thing of don't call it leadership. It's not proper leadership, you know? There's, there's, there's other kinds of leaders. And I just thought that I wanted to emphasize that that is really important. And on the question of language, um, apologies in advance. I know your intentions are great, all of you. But every time, as a post-colonial studies person, every time somebody says, give a voice, there's like something that goes through me about like, no, you're not giving a voice. You're lending a year. We're listening yeah. to somebody. We're not giving someone a voice because they already have a voice. What we're doing is giving them our attention with listening. And I, I mean, everywhere people just say that. And my question to you, finally, is, you know, the thing about um, the car, the car driving. I was once in Uganda, I think, and a car driver on a road late at night said, don't worry, I'm driving five cars. And I just thought, what did, what did he mean? He meant that he was driving the cars ahead, in front of him, behind him, and on either side. And I think if we are only ever always thinking of, you know, then even people we disagree, even drivers who are driving badly, then we're kind of like somehow able to drive along. On the fast thinking, slow thinking thing, I thought that was a great idea. I hope it won't be about fast decisions, because I've I can give you lots of examples of political uh, leadership right now who wants to prioritize fast decision making and efficient decision making, but what they really mean is let's cut out the democratic noise, let's not have you know, consensus creation. So I, yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna really quickly touch base because you put a bunch of wonderful points out. Um, did not say give a voice, always say amplify, because I do think in today's global system, it's important that we amplify, regardless of where you are in the world. Um, and I agree with you, everybody's empowered and has agency. It, it really is about amplifying the work they're doing and elevating it to, to ensure that other people can see it. Because I think that's how leaders recognize their own leadership, by having that role modeling um, for them. I, you know, I'm gonna answer the devil's advocate thing a little bit, because I don't think I did, and, and you've reminded me. Um, I actually agree with you. I, I do think that it's important um, to recognize that leadership is in all those little moments. As I had said during my speech, um, it is the moment when you see somebody acting racist on a bus. It is the moment when um, you notice a political figure is not necessarily agreeing with you where you choose to put your money, where you choose to campaign, canvas, elect, etc. Those are, I agree with you, little moments. But I, I fundamentally believe if you are not from the very beginning strong on your values and morals, it is very difficult in that moment, in that room, to be the volunteer. What we need to do is we need to enable people to recognize their leadership, and the only way people can recognize that is if we raise them with morals and values that are unquestionable to them. So when they're in that room, and for example, and this was something that happened last week, there was a pregnant woman on a bus, and nobody got up an incredibly pregnant woman, a lot of young men and women sitting in chairs, and nobody stood up. And it wasn't until one of the older women looked and said, are you guys serious? Like, let her sit down. And I think in that moment, had every single one of those people, it seems like a small decision, but had every single one of those people been taught from a young age something different, or, or had the moral and ethical you know, backbone, 
that decision would have been a lot easier to make. So, so yes, it is a decision. You make a choice, but I think it's a lot easier to make a choice when you fundamentally believe your morals and values will back you up when everybody else will ostracize you. That's, that's kind of where I come from, that devil's advocate point of view. Um, and the last comment, you know, I, I was recently in Italy, and my driver, um, I'm from Libya, so driving is not a walk in the park there either. Um, but Italy is is driving on steroids, and um, and my driver was like swerving in and out and almost hit a person and almost hit another car, and he was like, "Don't worry about it. They're all bad drivers, but I focus on me." <laughs> and I was like, "Everyone here is going to end up dead." So, <laughs> and I was terrified for a good 40 minutes. I've never been more scared in a car, and I. I really like the analogy of, yeah, you, you are. And when, once you're on a road, the fundamental reality is somebody probably is looking. Um, you probably you will impact other people. And when there's an eight-car pileup, nobody is looking at the fourth or fifth car and saying, oh, they, you know, they were a great driver. That's not what's, what's happening. And so I do think the me mentality, the isolationism we're seeing globally, especially politically, um, is a little terrifying because in a world as globalized as we are, it really... It really, I think, um, negates the importance of collaborative work uh, on issues like climate change, on issues like equality, human rights, migration, et cetera. Those are not, those permeate boundaries. I mean, global health permeates boundaries. And the fundamental reality is if we're not working on it together, we're not going to get there at all. And our political system, um, the way that we have established democracy today, is fundamentally reward tomorrow. And I think until we start tackling how we elect people and why we elect them and um, the messaging we have around immediate wins and those short-term wins, it's going to be very, very difficult to convince politicians to take on the leadership to say, I'm going to do something that has a much longer vision. And right now we're seeing a lot of companies take that on. We're seeing a lot of multilateral institutions like the UN and the EU. But we're seeing very few national governments say, hey, we're looking at a 30-year plan. Very few are doing that. And the ones that have, like China, have actually done it quite effectively. Their 15-year plan. So, so we have good role modeling, but we just don't see leadership there. If you want to take on that. I, I would just respond to the uh, give a voice amplify part, which I think it's a very good, um, uh, it's a very good rephrasing. I, I, I would rather take amplify than lend a year because the the behavior we were referring, which I find very important for leadership, is this particular uh, situation when you think of the people who are not in the room. I love that metaphor that, that you had because I've been trying for many years to think of the people who are not in the room in Romania because there's many of them. It's people with disabilities, it's the Roma people. You know, I go to talks about diversity given by companies and they are all about diversity and I ask them, where are the Roma employees? And you look around, and there there are none, and say, "What diversity are we talking about?" And I love to do that. And when in my trainings that I do corporate, whenever somebody makes a misogynistic joke, it just happened the other day. You know, I I, I would police that and I say, "That's you know, that's not funny. That's not right. I don't think your colleagues here appreciate that." And I do that all the time. But I've never policed homophobic comments or remarks, because I kind of you know, for me, and you know, I f I find it hard to sort of act in my own defense. And um, I remember when the referendum was last autumn, there was a referendum to ban um, um, gay marriage in the Constitution, although Romania has absolutely no protection for any sort of same-sex civil partnership. They wanted to ban it in the Constitution. And it was a, you know, a, a month of hate towards the LGBTQI community. I will always remember the people who took our side and who made amazingly supportive comments. I will also never forget the politicians who didn't say a thing. And I cannot forget them, unfortunately. And a few weeks ago, when actually a friend sent a, a meme or something on a, on a messenger group that was slightly, slightly homophobic, I didn't find it homophobic, uh, a, another friend intervened and said, you know, I think that's a bit not right. You know, <laughs> and he apologized, and I told him, really, I didn't find it, <laughs> find it homophobic, but I just loved that somebody stepped in because I, I felt that somebody th thought a bit about my feelings. So I think we should all do this all the time because it's a certain point in time it will come back and and although you don't really take a cost when you speak for the people who are not in the room, you sort of encourage other people to speak for you when you need them to do it.
Thank you. We already have questions uh, from from Slido. Uh, just on on the invisible uh, uh, minorities, I would like just to to congratulate some countries from Latin America who are here in the room. And uh, I often give to 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 our students the the example of of Chile that I, I saw firsthand, where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a ministry that uh, traditionally is is close to to the public scrutiny. Uh, at the gate uh, for the t for the visitors, uh, there were persons with disabilities, and they were so well integrated. I was so impressed that I will give this example every time I, I can. So um, it's not only about private companies, but the public companies, the public service uh, can can actually uh, be leading in that. And uh, Latin America is showing us uh, something quite uh, quite uh, extraordinary. And uh, we actually have a question related to that that was voted already uh, on Slido, and the question is uh, very uh, simple. Uh, you, you can solve it immediately. Um, should national politicians consider international moral obligations before national preferences? Uh, so, <laughs> basically, um, how shall we tackle this uh, global perspective when we have uh, local priorities? Why should we care about uh, poor people out there when we have our poor problems uh, out here. So um, this is going to be a, a heavy oversimplification of this answer, but um, yes, yes. And I don't think it should be before. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. It has to be a both and because international moral obligations and international crises become national crises very quickly if we do not solve them. They either become economic crises, they become political crises, and we're seeing that today. So if we, if we look at the, the root of the political challenges that exist today, they were not, a lot of them are not actually national in origin. There's definitely been national inclinations, but a lot of them have been spurred on by regional or international crises. And they've turned into severely national dilemmas, which have then, again, gone chicken and egg back to international crises and, and driven a, an entirely new political apparatus globally. So it's not an either or. And the fact that we still look at it in that lens means we don't truly understand how interconnected our economies, our political systems, our media, our, we don't seem to understand how globalized we are yet, and that worries me a little bit. It's, it's never an either or, it has to be a both and. If you're not considering both, you're gonna lose both. Obviously my, my answer is the same. The, um, the only thing I would add is that obviously you, you need to understand, especially in the, in the environment that Dr. Morab described very well, where politicians are bound by this you know, short elections um, cycles, which on the other hand, you know, you cannot just ban them. You cannot elect politicians for 10 years or 20 years because that will be the road to totalitarianism. So it's, this is a difficult question, but in this world where they need to respond to election cycle pressures, it's very hard for them to, you know, to, to, to always, um, you know, think about international moral obligations. What I do think is absolutely despicable is politicians who agitate, who pander basically to their electorate's darkest fears. To me, that is inexcusable. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm tomorrow Pope Francis is coming to Romania, and I was also thinking about His Holiness when you're talking about leadership positions, precisely because we have this, this example, his predecessor and himself. You are in a position of leadership. You're, of course, a white male, but still this is a position that comes with a lot of obligations. You can just simply do it ritualistically, like his predecessor mostly did it, or you can do it like Pope Francis did and become the voice of the refugees, for example, which is amazing. You think about Pope Francis has become, I think, the l one of the strongest voices in favor of refugees in Europe, which is sad if you think about it. I'm just going to quickly, the only way that I think politicians can pander um, to kind of the biggest fears is if those fears remain unsolved. That's what's happened. It's because a crisis remained unsolved and people kept trying to band-aid it that politicians could tap into it. But head at that moment, people said, we need to focus on this. This is going to turn into a national catastrophe for us 
I don't think we would be in the same position, not in Europe, not in the US, not globally. So if we actually look at international moral obligations as obligations, because they are, our countries have signed up for them, then they, we give a lot less ammunition to people who want to utilize them for their political gain. That is what I think we, we often ignore in the political conversation. Thank you for your talk. My name is Andre Poma. I, I, um, I think I have a question that speaks or addresses the ethics part of the, of the, of the, of the talk. Um, I know that Google and many private corporations, and especially multinationals, have in-house philosophers, and especially ethicists and moral philosophers that are, they hire. So I was wondering whether, when it comes to either other types of NGOs that are not, do not have that particular structure, um, in particular NGOs that work, work in development, uh, and, but also public institutions, where do you see the, the, the role of uh, moral philosophers and ethicists proper within those uh, leadership teams? Um, if there is any role for them. And I also have a, a question, I don't know if it's the, the place to, to ask it for, for Luciana about this index for me measuring w wasted time. You know that back in the 80s, the French had um, uh, a ministry actually created during Mitterrand for a spare time. Yeah. It was called the Ministère du Loisir. Um, it lasted less than a year. Uh, so, so it was very, very short-lived, but I was just wondering, because it, it, it's a very nice and almost poetic proposal um, but I was wondering how would you factor the time that you spend measuring lost time, <laughs> uh, whether it's not self-defeating. <laughs> Some sacrifices must be done. Huh? Uh, let's, let's take more questions uh, first from, from the audience and then we are trying to... Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Radu Motsok. I run the local office of TechSoup. We do civil society and technology and digital staff capacity building for NGOs and lately we've been you know concerned with this challenge of uh, giving a voice to civil society gaining audiences as others are and we don't necessarily like them and you know as probably many of you we're struggling with this with this um, global I would say competition for larger and larger audiences because we are we are in a battle for a attention. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment a bit about this, maybe this, the relationship between leadership and publicity, because, yeah, I do agree that good deeds... Uh, publicity. 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 No, I agree. Good things and good people and good deeds needs to, need to be seen. And... Do you think leaders need to be intentional about, about being seen, about get, growing their audience? Does it occur naturally? Do you need to have a plan, like carve out two hours per day to tweet? And if so, where do you stop? How do you prevent falling into the industry of personal branding and growing your audience? I, I don't think I have an actual opinion, but... <laughs> Even if you have some questions and dilemmas about it, I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Perhaps we, we could try to, to answer this already. So I'm not sure how helpful my answer will be on the leadership and publicity thing, um, because I think your public is, in my opinion, a effective leader's public is the people that he or she needs to influence. And I don't think we all need to influence two million people on Twitter. Uh, unless you're running for office, that's probably not the avenue you want to go down. I think the most effective leadership, uh, the most effective leaders I've seen have a significant amount of power and influence with their public. And sometimes your audience is one prime minister. Sometimes your audience is the security uh, community. Sometimes they're very insulated communities and they... Um, so in terms of that, do, uh, do leaders need to go out and seek? I think that's the same, the same answer. I, if that's part of your bread and butter then that should probably be something you allocate two hours a day to. Um, somebody in my position does not necessarily ever need to do that, thank God, knock on wood. Um, and I would argue a lot of the effective leaders I see are not the ones running their own Twitters, <laughs> um, nor are they the ones running their own media. So usually by the time you're trying to connect with a larger population, you have an expert doing that for you. Um, which is great. Uh, not all NGOs can, can get that kind of expertise. But, uh, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, there was a study recently about um, who we buy, 
what companies we buy from and why we buy from them and which media sources we trust and all of this stuff. And, um, and people trust the media a lot less than they trust word of mouth. Like, a lot less. You're more likely to buy from something if one of your friends have told you about it. You're more likely to believe a media source if a friend has told you about it. You're more likely to elect somebody if your friend has told you about it, right? And so I think we often, in the world of, like, Twitter and Facebook and whatever else, I think we often um, ignore the importance of our actual community, the actual word of mouth around us. And so if you're an NGO and you're doing incredible work and people in your neighborhood are talking about the incredible work you're doing, then naturally that's going to move, right? But if you're an NGO and nobody in your community has heard about you, but everybody on Twitter has, then how effective are you really? So I, I think a lot of us change, chase online clout and have very little on the ground legitimacy, and that concerns me a little bit. But that's not an answer to your question in any way. I cannot help you become more public. Um, that I don't know how. Um, and in terms of philosophers at Google, my goodness. Um, I would like to meet them. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I, th I think it's pretty interesting. They're not the only uh, corporation that does it. And what I find so interesting about it is um, oftentimes, and some doctors do this too in some studies, um, we bring the people we think will give us cover for what we want to do, right? Politicians are great at it. Um, lawyers are great at, I mean, most professional fields that, that need some sort of cover are very good at getting in a team that says, you know what, philosophically we're doing good here because we're giving people information. And, um, and I think Google has a lot of challenges, so maybe they need a bigger team. I don't know. Um, but I would hope that other companies do not follow suit. And the reason I say that is because I do not think we need companies themselves to dictate what is right and wrong. I do think in, in the space of companies like Google, companies that have that much power and that much access and that much information, there does need to be stronger and more robust central regulation and, and decision making by consumers and by the general public about what is right and wrong. I do not think it should be left to the people who are looking at their bottom line to dictate um, what impacts it. As a leader in personal branding uh, training and uh, having I studied I that. I don't run personal <laughs> branding training, but I do believe communication is my main professional skill. So um, I will say this, that I do, I do believe a leader needs good communication skills, which start obviously with segmenting and targeting your audience. Um, but I did see many a times, regrettably, leaders who lacked communication skills and were sort of despising this. And I've always found that to be you know, regrettable on their part because they lost a lot of power, a lot of beneficial power that they could bring to their, to their beneficiaries. In my case, for example, what I do for the past, what I've done for the past three years and a half, I was, I've been working with Hope and Homes for Children, a foundation that is closing down orphanages in Romania for 21 years. It's an amazing work. And when I first met them 10 years ago for Princess Marina Stuz, I was surprised at the fact that I had never heard of them. And they were doing tremendous work in Romania, tremendous. And I was like, how is this possible? Because they were working in North Romania. Romania is a very centralized country. If you're not in Bucharest, you basically don't exist. And ever since, they've been uh, ramping up their, their presence in Bucharest. And they've started a communication fundraising office here, which they've asked me to, to help lead three years and a half ago. And I do think it's helped them a lot, not only with, obviously, fundraising, which is their, one of the main concerns, because the, the international funds are no longer um, enough, but also with the clout that they have with the official makers, because the, the work that they are doing cannot be done by themselves alone. You can only do it in partnership with local and central authorities. And being known is, is a factor that influences people's decisions in a very irrational way, from time immemorial. And again, here I just think we need to be realistic. People have this strange reaction when they know of you. It's not rational, it's emotional. But I think when you are trying to do good for, for the world, you should pick your fights. Do you want to change people's neurology? Or do you want to use it in your favor? Um, and I've been working for a year in Brussels at the European Commission as communication advisor. And uh, yeah, I. One of, I, I, I'm a pro, not, I'm not, not a pro, I'm, I'm a Europeanist. I believe in the United States of Europe. I would love for the European project to succeed. 
I've seen in Brussels a, a part of why it fails. There are only leaders there who have consistency but are not good communicators and they've despised communication all their lives and they are indeed influenced with what you say, they are influenced, they are influenced with other leaders, they are, but still with the people of Europe, most of them are nobodies. Um, and because their Twitters are followed by other people in Brussels, they're not on, 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 offline, on um, the, the television, on, on, on traditional media, on, on Facebook, they simply despise it. And I think that's really regrettable. But I do am with you that I have seen the other part, that people are only communication. And indeed, that's only superficial, that is not. And that is sad, but I, th I think a good leader should marry the two. I wholeheartedly agree. I think you should know your audience. And if you are somebody who works for the European Union and people in the European Union don't know you, then you probably aren't doing a very good job. But I also think if you're somebody who works in a neighborhood in Bucharest, then people in Paris don't need to necessarily know who you are for you to be effective. So know your audience and cater to that, I think, is the best communication strategy. Speaking of knowing your audi audience, actually, uh, someone is asking that should the no national politicians deliver the will of the people regardless of the implications of the decision? And they gave as an example, as in the case of the Brexit. Sorry, what? <laughs> should the national politicians deliver the will of the people regardless of the implications of, the, uh, of these decisions, as in the case of, of Brexit? No. <laughs> you know, I'm all... Yeah, but not only Brexit, but I always, you know, think of if we had put to a referendum in the 1930s, what should be done with the Jewish population of Europe, with the Roma population of Europe, with the homosexual population of Europe? Uh, should the leaders of Europe would have been bounded by the result of that referendum? God forbid. Uh, I, you know, I think this is also another example of leadership. Uh, of knowing, you know, when you are, we were in representative democracies, we are not in direct democracies, and I think it's, it's a duty of the leaders, of political leaders, to know, you know, what to put to a vote, what not to put to a vote, and when the vote is clearly, now I'm not saying they should not um, affect Brexit, that's, I mean, like, I don't agree with Brexit either, but I think it's hard when you've had a referendum not to follow the, the will of the people. Well, I'm, I'm, why even go to the 1930s? I mean, if you had a referendum in many countries today about Muslims, you would probably have a very negative response, right? And so the reality is I walk into countries where I know the vast majority of the population probably thinks I'm oppressed or should be killed or one of those, you know, different mixes. That's, I mean, people are, I think, if we're actually invested in representative democracy, then you trust your leadership. I think Brexit started as a failure of leadership from the very onset, in an attempt to appease the more vocal voices within a party, right? So, so Brexit's kind of its own challenge because it's been this multi-year, and, and, it, and the, the, the ego has gotten so strong and they've went so far that it's difficult to come back and yada, yada, yada. But, but I think the, the major question is you should never as a country put your populace in that position and a populace should never Dem expect that in a representative democracy. I fundamentally don't believe it. I think that's the challenge. What we've, you cannot say we're going to be a representative democracy and we trust these politicians to be able to commit to different things, to be able to balance our budgets, to be able to insure our taxes, to be able to defend our country, to be able to do all of these things. And for the single most important decision in a country, to put it as a referendum to people who may never have voted before, to people who might not necessarily even understand the intricacies, who definitely don't understand the implications of, of exiting. So I think we need to be a bit more honest honest as citizens about what is what where what our political systems are if we don't want a representative democracy then that's a different conversation but the second you've elected officials to represent on your behalf then they need to have the courage of effective leadership to say we're not doing a referendum that's insane we need to actually resolve this internally. Because I do think Brexit is actually one of the biggest mistakes that has been made in modern politics. I think we're going to feel the ramifications of it for some time. I think it will forever uh, impact, at least in the coming generations, the European Union and the sentiment towards the European Union and other countries and the efficacy of the European Union on a global scale. Uh, and and I, think it, I think it was completely asinine and it was a 1% decision. I just think it's fundamentally unfair for the future generation that voted overwhelmingly for European Union. So I, I, I really disagree with this belief that 
uh, you prioritize a popular vote. Thank you. Uh, more questions from, from the audience? Uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, one in the back. Amplifying uh, hello, the voice. My, na my name is uh, Irina Nakantor. I'm coming from uh, Babes Boy University. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, uh, Dr. Murakbet, and very interesting comments, uh, Luciana and uh, also Mr. Bukurench. Uh, most of the ideas uh, I've heard are about uh, individual leadership. What about collective leadership? Could we have something? We are talking about democracy. And we are talking, it's right, about representative democracy. But lately, uh, and especially in Romania, we had very strong participatory democracy. And in, in those cases, I've never seen one individual leadership taking uh, steps. But instead, what I've seen is a new form of collective leadership that made government and made politics change. Thank you very much. <laughs> what about that? I'm going to need some clarification. Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Because I didn't really understand that question. So the fact that uh, we are focusing, uh, when we talk about uh, leadership, we are talking about individuals. Anyway, anyway we, we, uh, so all the examples I've seen here, I've heard here, uh, were uh, about individual uh, leaders when talking about effective leadership. What about collective leadership? Could we have a collective leader, a collective person as a leadership? Okay. Uh, I just think this is a bit of a local uh, question. If it refers, for example, to the protest movements that have uh, um, um, that happened in Romania in the last two years, which indeed were kind of interesting protests because they were leaderless. And many people spoke about this leaderless movement. Um, I will say this, I do believe in collective leadership, which is the sum of many acts of individual leadership. It was, re you know, the, those weeks we spent at minus 14 degrees in the Piazza Victoria Square were individual decisions by Middle working, middle working class people every to take away all their evenings and be there and stand in cold and sleet and protest. And the result of all those individual leadership decisions was this huge collective leadership process. However, I'm always reminded, I'm like at the time, whenever I heard these people saying, it's amazing, this is a leaderless movement. It's a, I always said, guys, we need leaders. You want a party for whom these people should vote come the election. And if during the same time, in parallel, a political movement would not ha would, had not been formed for which the people protesting had, were able to vote for on Sunday, this would have been lost. So I do believe in the power of collective leadership, but I always, like at the time, I was m far more respecting of the people who sometimes were not protesting in the square, but were in an office drawing up plans, creating a political project for the future, which I think, so I think the two of them work and in hand, you know, Arab Spring, same thing. You have the protest toppling power, but then you need somebody to effect that power in a democratic way. Otherwise, the protests are in vain. So I think we've talked about collective leadership quite a bit, actually, tonight. Um, we've emphasized the importance of inclusive leadership. We've emphasized the importance of collaborative leadership, collective leadership. I think fundamentally, um, and, and this may be the realist in me talking, but I do not think leaderless movements last for long. Um, that's a fundamental reality. Uh, people either lose momentum because they don't see it progressing or somebody takes up the reins as a leader um, in that movement, either as a spokesperson initially and, and you can move forward. And there's great examples. One of the most recent on a large scale is the Wall, uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, right? So um, I think what I define as collective leadership is an, an ability for a lot of those individual leaders to come together and say this is not an either or. Right, for the ability for 
somebody like me to say, okay, you know what, my expertise is in X, Y, and Z, this is what I can focus on. And your expertise is in mobilizing locally, that's what you can focus on. And your expertise is in communication, that's what you can focus on. And for you to be able to come together and create something that is representative and inclusive of a community that has buy-in from that community and actually has the voices of that community represented. So we don't all look the same. We might not all have the same views on everything. We don't all have the same religious background. We're not all the same gender, et cetera. That to me is collective leadership. It's authentic and representative leadership. That doesn't mean you don't get to be an individual leader. That's not what it means fundamentally. If someone here is like, I want to be an individual leader, this collective leadership thing is not for me. I actually think collective leadership makes you a much better individual leader because you can learn from different people, you hear different voices, you can measure different perspectives, you can strategize differently. But fundamentally, at its core, every movement will ultimately have a leader. If it doesn't start with one, it will have one, it will have many. But that's the only way they actually become policy, or they, they become institutionalized, or, or they actually become implemented. Otherwise, I mean, it's protests and hashtags. Um, what advice would you give to your um, younger self for effective leadership and ethical leadership? <laughs> In my particular can you hear? I think I would have advised me to be more um, to be kinder to myself. Um, but I'm not particularly sure this is the type of advice that I would like to give people in this country. By all means, be bolder, be more courageous. <laughs> Kindness will come afterwards. Um, before I answer this question, I really want to say I did not mean to underappreciate the importance of protests and civil disobedience. I think uh, they're actually incredibly important, and I think based on what we're seeing around the world, but particularly in the US, a lot of young political leaders are inspired by their participation in protests. So please be as civilly disobedient as possible when you believe in something. Um, and yeah. Uh, advice to my younger self, I actually, so I fundamentally believe that every decision you make or every the universe works in mysterious ways and, um, and you learn a lot even from your mistakes. So I actually probably would give myself, when I was younger, that advice, um, that you need to be able to learn from every experience. I think particularly I started when I was quite young, I was 21, um, and I very quickly, I did a TED Talk within two years and very quickly um, became uh, quite well known and I think the challenge there is when there are so many people paying attention to what you say, you often do not measure the importance of what you're saying with that weight. And if I could give myself younger, uh, myself when I was younger advice, it would be you are going to make mistakes, they are going to teach you, have the humility to learn from them, um, and have the courage to reach out to people and ask them for advice. That's probably what I would tell myself. Thank you very much.